going to go ahead and call us to order and declare that we have a quorum of seven members present. Welcome to this meeting of the College Station Independent School Board of Trustees. We were elected at large to represent the interest of our community and our state in educating our students. Our mission for our students in this district is success each life, each day, each hour. We adhere to all pertinent laws, policies, and procedures in posting agendas and conducting our meetings. The detailed agenda information was made available to us at least 72 hours in advance, and we have all come to this meeting informed and prepared. We have just completed a workshop meeting where we heard reports and discussed much of the information needed to make decisions in either this meeting or in upcoming meetings. This is a meeting of the seven trustees in a public setting rather than a public meeting. As such, public comment is included on the agenda at a specific time and requires us to listen rather than take action so as to abide by the Open Meetings Act. We are pleased that you have taken this time this evening to join us. We are very proud of this school district and we thank you for your interest in and support of our students. Dr. Ely. Thank you, Mr. Harris, uh, members of the board, community. Uh, welcome this evening. We will begin tonight's meeting as we do uh, all of our regularly scheduled meetings uh, with the uh, recitation of the uh, Pledge of Allegiance uh, to the American flag, to the Texas flag, uh, and a moment's silence. To lead us this evening, we have some great students from Oakwood Intermediate School and AM Consolidated Middle School. I'd like to invite their principals, Josh Simak and Omar Spedia, uh, up to the microphone to introduce our pledge leaders for this evening. Gentlemen. Dr. Ely Board, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Amazing Wildcats. Not only Amazing Wildcats that we're lucky to have at Oakwood, but two students we're lucky to have in College Station ISD. Uh, first up, she is very nervous tonight, and I don't understand it. Her name is Natalie Green. She was the lead. She played Gabriella in our high school musical and did an absolutely amazing job. She won second place in the writing competition um, for the Brazos Valley this year, winning $200, making writing more popular. And she participated multiple times in our talent show, but perhaps her most important job this year is she is an office aide. And as part of her office aide duties, she takes care of Mr. Granny's fish tank. And since she has taken over his fish tank and named all of the fish, we have yet to have a ceremony in the bathroom saying goodbye to any fish. <laughs> So I don't know what we're going to do without Natalie's assistance uh, taking care of Mr. Grandy. So Natalie, please come on up. The next young man that I'm going to introduce is Mr. Corey Johnson. He has an infectious smile. He literally sprints into the building every single day. I have to remind him to slow down as he gets to the front doors. One neat fact about Corey is he is the only, his dad and himself, they're the only father-son duo that I know of that had the same teacher teach them in the fifth grade. So we still have Miss Kilo on campus, and Corey has been um, – in her class as well as his father. Corey's an amazing kid. He's in an avid program. He's one of our avid ambassadors. He, like I said, he has an infectious smile. You're not going to see him walking around the building without a smile on his face. And both of these students, you will hear their names and see their names again because they are destined for big things. Corey, please come on up. Good evening, Dr. Ely and the board. Um, all the way from Bobcat country, I've brought to you uh, two great Bobcats that exemplify the Bobcat spirit. Uh, first up is uh, Dexter Harwell. Uh, Dexter, every morning, come on up, Dexter. Uh, every morning, uh, I, I can always count on him to hold open the doors for everybody. Both of these Bobcats have a servant heart, and they are always there with a smile. Uh, Dexter is a seventh grader who wants to be a surgeon when he grows up. He's also in our Leeds program and is an ambassador for the campus. Uh, our next Bobcat is seventh grader, Molly Larson. And Molly, uh, in, in addition to always having a smile in the hallways, she always is a, is a ray of sunshine in the hallway. She also helps out with Miss Polzer's rabbit and goes and helps feed her every morning and uh, feed the rabbits and with the pets there. So uh, we love having Molly and Dexter around. And like I said, they exemplify everything that we want in a bobcat on uh, in, over here in bobcat country. Please rise and join us in the pledges in a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, 
indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please rise for the Texas Pledge of Allegiance. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and invisible. Please remain standing for the moment of silence. You may now be seated. <laughs> Moving to item C2, uh, we have a number of recognitions this evening. Um, we have our academic UIL state champions, Skills USA, Business Professionals of America. Uh, so we've got a lot of folks. Uh, since I will probably stumble over this, I've enlisted the help of a professional, somebody who's even spoken on the radio before. So Mr. Glenn Winkle will be reading all of the names. Uh, and students, when your name is called, and uh, sponsors, when your name is called, please come up here to Mr. Harrison, who'll have your certificate, and come all the way through and shake all of our hands. So, all right. So Just start. a secret, if you don't know how to pronounce a name, say it fast and with conviction, and people will believe you. <laughs> okay? So... We're going to start with the uh, UIL Academic State Champions. Uh, students from AM Consolidated High School and College Station High School recently won a trio of individual state champions in an event team championship at the 5A UIL State Academic Meet. Students compete at the district and regional level, and if they place high enough, compete at the state level in an array of academic categories. The following students won the 5A State Championship in their respective event. Please come forward as I call your name. Robert Dorman, an individual state champion in current issues. <laughs> Sayuni Dharmasena, ready writing. Abed Razvi, Congressional Debate. And the following four students won the Current Issues uh, Team Championship. Shiva Saravanan. Edwin Hard. Nicholas Macri, and Andrew Zhang. Uh, these guys also had folks who coached them throughout the year, and we'd like to recognize them if they're here as well. Um, coaching one of these students, um, at least one of these students, uh, Brian Alford. Oh. April Falco. April. Oh. Susie Richards. And Bobby Rodriguez. I think Bobby's at home with a new little one. Yes. 
We're gonna move on to our Skills USA state champions. A total of 17 students from AMCHS and CSHS won state championships in their respective Skills USA a event or were elected to represent Texas at the Skills USA National Leadership and Skills Conference this June in Kentucky. The following students place first and will represent Texas in their respective contest. Please come forward as I call your name. In 3D animation and visualization, Jack Franklin. In the same category, Ben Motor. This state, champion, this state champion won in additive manufacturing, which for the layperson is 3D printing. Uh, and this student, there's actually two of them, Tian Da Huang and Alex Hilty. In advertising design, Leah Liu. We had four students combine on a team to win the Career Pathway Showcase in Information Technology. Those students are Kate Primrose, David Wynn, John Adams, Mitchell Coopersmith, We also had two students team up to win the state championship in cybersecurity. Emmanuel Preciado. And Muhammad Saeed. In models of excellence, we had two students, Sam Chandler. And Ben Castro. Ethan Martinez won the state championship in technical computer applications. Roger Wang won the state championship in telecommunication and cabling. We had a television and video production team win a state championship, Mason Cochran. And Gracie Lawhon. Coaches for all of these students, Shannon Espedia. Stephen Green. Michael Howard. Jason Walling. And Mr. Patrick Powell.
We also had six students from our two comprehensive high schools that qualified to compete at the National Business Professionals of America, or BPA, National Conference, uh, which was actually recently held in Anaheim, California. Uh, we're honoring all the students who qualified for nationals tonight, but since the national contest was just held, we'll also point out any placings that they may have had at nationals. Um, so the following individuals qualified for the, co the national contest, so please come forward as I call your name. David Australian in C++ programming, and he also placed fourth in the entire nation. Kathy Ding in Advanced Office Systems and Procedures, and she placed seventh in the nation. <laughs> Allison Fisher advanced to the Nationals in Database Applications. <laughs> Tian Da Huang advanced in PC Servicing and Troubleshooting. Justin Park placed fourth in the nation in fundamental accounting. And finally, Abid Razvi uh, advanced in extemporaneous speech. And a few of the, uh, the sponsors, the sponsors for these students, Chanika Brooks. Terry Casto. Jill Conlon, <laughs> Kathy Fisher, <laughs> Dennis Rhodes, And Diane Reister. And we have, do have one more recognition tonight, a, a, an additional staff recognition. Um, we have a bus rodeo state qualifier uh, who works for our transportation department. And when I say rodeo, it's spelled R-O-A-D-E-O, -E rodeo. Um, Josh Shelton will represent the school district and the region at the state rodeo to be held in Corpus Christi in June. Josh qualified by taking first place at the CSISD versus BSISD rodeo and second at the regional competition in spring. Listen to some of these, these uh, events. Uh, one of them is called Backup Alley, where it tests your ability to back into a stall at an angle. Uh, I'm not gonna say all of these, but um, you have to do events that include railroad crossings, right and left turns, parallel park. Uh, you have to go through tight squeezes at an angle, and that one's called Offset Alley. Um, and perhaps the most, did I say parallel park? That's a school bus, yeah. just, okay. <laughs> a little about Josh, he joined the CSISD Transportation Department in September of 2017, and in addition to driving a daily route, he writes and edits for search engine optimization and is the president of the Brazos Riders, which is a local writing group. Josh, come on up and be recognized. Just want to say something real quick about uh, to all the parents out there. Thank you for uh, all the support that you are these kids. We know that their their success is is largely dependent upon uh, your great leadership and your great support. 
Uh, I can only imagine the amount of time that you've uh, given to them to get them to practice, make sure they get their homework done and all those things that need to, they need to do to be su successful. So uh, if there are any parents, grandparents, or siblings uh, in the or anybody, family members of anybody uh, who was uh, uh, recognized today, please stand so we can recognize you as well. That's right. Including Josh. There you go. Thank you all so much. And that concludes our uh, recognitions for this evening, Mr. Harris. As we're getting settled, I'll, I'll recognize the artwork and, and point it out to you on the back wall. It's been provided by some of our talented students from Southwood Valley Elementary, Oakwood Intermediate, Pecan Trail Intermediate, and A&M Consolidated Middle School. So if you haven't already, uh, take a, an opportunity to go look at that artwork and you'll be uh, impressed with the talent uh, on display there. Uh, that takes us to item D the consent agenda, which is items G, H4, H5, J1, J2, J3, J4, J5, J6, and J7. Uh, okay, Dr. Ely, which one? So the administration would like to pull item H4 uh, from the consent agenda for discussion since we were not able to discuss it in the workshop meeting at five o'clock. Okay, uh, any other items that need to be pulled? Anybody wanna make a motion? I would move we present, uh, approve the consent agenda as presented. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Uh, Aye. All opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Takes us to E1, board directions, reports, announcements. Uh, does anyone have any reports for the group? I do for the Education Foundation. Um, it's a busy time of year for the Education Foundation, and I'm very excited to report um, that we, the Education Foundation held the 2019 Hall of Fame Banquet, where 64 seniors were chosen along with their educators um, and were recognized, um, really celebrating their integrity, uh, leadership, school spirit, and positive attitude. Um, they were nominated by the high school faculty, and it was um, a wonderful event to honor these seniors before they leave us in CSISD. Also, I'm very happy to report a record-breaking um, year for the foundation, um, $105,000 in scholarships were given this year to 77 graduates. Um, this is the most um, that the Education Foundation has ever been able to give, and in large part that's in the you know extreme amount of generosity of our parents, families, business owners, um, so very excited. I know Teresa and team um, were thrilled to be able, even some last minute scholarships so they didn't realize that they were gonna be able to give. So, great, great year for the foundation. I would like to follow up on that and I got to participate in those two events um, as well and in part because I have a graduating senior. Uh, and it, it's one thing to, to get to see it as a, an interested member of the community and a board member. It's quite another as a, as a parent of a student. Uh, and so I wanna personally thank you, uh, Teresa, for the, the work that you and your team do uh, on behalf of all the parents uh, and students who get to be a part of it and get to benefit from your efforts. And also, uh, to be sure that we publicly thank the members of our community who support the efforts. Uh, it's the individuals and businesses that get involved and give back uh, both of time and their money. Um, and it makes the foundation and its efforts so successful. So thank you to any uh, of you who are here as well. 
Uh, any other reports? Okay, superintendent's report, Dr. Ely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harris. Just want to talk a little bit uh, initially about the legis uh, on give a brief legislative update. The last day of the 140 day legislative session uh, is Monday, which is Memorial Day. It's the last time they have to get uh, anything done. The, the one thing that they have to do is pass the budget, House Bill 1, which I believe is, is moving forward uh, as it should be uh, to, to gain passage. The, the signature legislation that we're watching uh, right now is, of course, as we have been all spring semester, is House Bill 3. Where we are in the process right now is House Bill 3. One version has been passed by the House. A different version of House Bill 3 has been passed by the Senate. Uh, there is a 10-member conference committee, ten, uh, five senators and five representatives, who are going through um, meeting after meeting of negotiation to try to bring these two bills together in a manner that can be passed by both the House and the Senate. Uh, so that meaningful school finance uh, legislation can move forward to benefit the school kids uh, of this great state. Um, we uh, just uh, would like to point out that Mr. Martindale, our deputy superintendent, and I went uh, to Austin on behalf of this community. We went on Friday on behalf of the community, delivering a letter from the Board of Trustees uh, to members of the legislature, especially those 10 members of the conference committee. Uh, we were able to visit the offices of all 10 conferees, as well as our state reps' offices. Uh, we had great conversations uh, with Representative Cassell and Representative Rainey, both of whom are great supporters and advocates for public schools in this community and for College Station ISD. And I, I know that they are working very hard uh, in the best interest uh, of, of our school kids. Uh, we were able to deliver some letters and meet with some different uh, individuals, uh, a, a rep or two. We uh, did have the great uh, uh, blessing to be able to meet, uh, by happen chance, in the stairwell uh, with uh, Chairman Larry Taylor, who is the chairman of the Senate Education Committee. Uh, and he invited us back to his office to go over some of the information in more detail. So we had an opportunity to explain how some of these uh, key components of House Bill 3 would impact the students uh, and our schools here in College Station. So I appreciate the opportunity to have that. Uh, to, to visit with him. Uh, so we are waiting anxiously as everybody else is. These discussions take place behind the scenes so we don't know where they're going. Uh, there are several key components in regards to uh, educator compensation, whether it be teacher pay or uh, um, other uh, additional school employees. Um, there's revenue caps, there's rollback numbers, there's uh, uh, current versus prior year values. We've given our feedback uh, to the people who matter on this and so we will see where we are on this. I am as I've said a few times uh, from this chair, I'm cautiously optimistic. I remain cautiously optimistic, maybe even more than cautiously, that something's going to happen. Uh, the 181 senators and representatives went to Austin in January with a mandate to do something about property tax uh, reform and about school finance. And I believe they're within striking distance of getting something done on both, especially on school finance. So uh, we will continue uh, to follow what's going on. We will continue to, to provide feedback to those uh, representatives who uh, represent our school district, and uh, we will see where we are. We should know something in less than a week. Um, and if we do, then uh, I would anticipate that that would have us in a, in a better opposition. Um, to what degree? The devil is in the details, and so we'll figure that out uh, should that come to fruition. It's the biggest thing that we're following uh, right now uh, in Austin because uh, it means the most to our kids in the school district. So um, that's kind of where we are with a legislative update, and we should know more next month. Uh, just want to talk a little bit about some upcoming events as well. Um, uh, tomorrow I get the great opportunity to go eat lunch with the Brazos County Retired School Personnel Group. These are folks who have poured their lives into our kids uh, for decades uh, and are retired uh, from Bryan or College Station or Navasota or wherever. Uh, They're going to uh, award scholarships, one to a College Station ISD student, one to a Bryan ISD student. I just want to recognize them. Uh, these ladies and gentlemen are tireless workers on our behalf too, not just, you know, when they when they left the classroom, they still band together to meet, to talk about how they can influence legislation, how they can advocate uh, for our kids, and how they can give back. And that's 
uh, you know, exemplified in what they're doing for these scholarships that they provide for a couple students from the Bryan College Station area. So I appreciate the opportunity to go uh, break bread with them uh, tomorrow at lunch. Uh, College View High School's uh, graduation uh, is going to be Thursday night at 7 p.m. at Christ United Methodist Church. Um, so we're looking forward uh, to that ceremony. If you've never been, uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. I encourage everybody in the audience to go. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful ceremony. I look forward to uh, the next graduating class of College View. Uh, and then uh, the two larger schools will be graduating on Friday at Reed Arena. Just a reminder to everybody that College Station High School's graduation will be at 4 o'clock. Uh, leave early uh, if you want to make it in time. A uh, lot of traffic uh, in and around Reed Arena. Uh, A&M Consolidated's will be at 7.30. We've added an additional 30 minutes in between the two uh, so that we can uh, manage the traffic with College Station High School kids and, and families leaving and the Consol kids and families coming. So if you're going to the Consol one, leave early also. Um, and so those will be at 4 o'clock and 7.30 on Friday. And so uh, we're excited. It's been a great school year. Um, this is the busiest week of the entire school year, but we're excited because we get to launch, you know, over 800 uh, graduates uh, into the next uh, realm of their life, uh, into college or career or both. And uh, we're just looking forward to celebrating that. And for all of us in this room, uh, board members, uh, teachers, administrators, parents alike, uh, just wish everybody a great and restful summer. And that's uh, my report, Mr. Harris. Great. Thank you very much. It takes us to item F, hearing of citizens. Do we have any cards? I do not. Okay. It takes us to H1. Consider approval of the K-8 through English Language Arts Textbook Adoption for the 2019-2020 school year. Dr. Ely. Thank you, Mr. Harris. <clears throat> Excuse me, members of the board. Um, instructional materials are updated uh, and, uh, periodically. Um, in all of our various subject areas. Proclamation 2019 uh, is a large uh, instructional materials uh, updating uh, because it includes Spanish language arts and English language arts in various grade levels. As you can imagine, the instructional materials involved uh, with uh, K through eight English language arts and, and others that we have uh, can be pretty extensive. It requires a lot of work uh, to, to look through the materials, have our uh, employees make recommendations, have those out to, uh, to, to people in the community who are interested and parents who are interested. Um, I'd like to present to you Aaron, Mr. Aaron Hogan, who is our coordinator of English Language Arts, uh, and he is the one who shepherded us through that process this year, uh, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, Proclamation 2019, uh, the process we use, the recommendations that we are making, and this will uh, serve as a recommendation for your approval uh, this evening. So with that, Mr. Hogan. Thank you, Dr. Ely. Mr. Harris, members of the board, I'm here on behalf of our textbook adoption committee to bring a recommendation for instructional materials for English language arts, Spanish language arts, um, under Proclamation 2019. With that goal of recommending instructional materials to the board for adoption, I want to give you a little bit of background and information before I present our recommendations. That'll look like a little overview of the requirements of Proclamation 2019. Um, explanation of the season of change that we find ourselves in, not only in the curriculum department, but specifically within English language arts, an overview of our review process, and then I'll share our recommendation, um, the recommendation really that I bring forward from the committee. When it comes to the requirements of Proclamation 2019, one of the biggest pieces is that we form a committee to review and recommend instructional materials for adoption in the following areas. English language arts and reading, grades K through eight. Spanish language arts and reading, grades K through five. Handwriting in both English and in Spanish, grades K through five. Spelling, again, in both English and in Spanish, first through sixth grade. And English learners language arts, seventh and eighth grade. Also under Proclamation 2019 is a personal financial literacy class, um, but the information on those courses, materials for those courses will be presented at a later date. Additional requirements um, include, some, um, uh, include the following, um, eligible materials must cover at least 50% of the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, or the TEKS, for the subject and grade level in both the student and teacher materials. They must cover 100% of the English Language Proficiency Standards, or ELPS. They must comply with applicable manufacturing standards, and they must be free from factual errors at the time they are delivered to schools. Really, that leaves us with four big questions. What are the resources that we need for four groups of courses? Our K through five English Language Arts, six through eight English Language Arts, 
K through five Spanish language arts, and then our handwriting needs in both English and in Spanish in grades K through five. And that's what we looked at as a committee, those four big questions. Um, spelling materials are integrated into the language arts materials that we're recommending tonight. So you saw them listed out separately on the requirements, uh, but the materials that we've selected uh, don't require separate, separate spelling materials for our students and teachers. So let's look a bit at the season of change that we find ourselves in. Um, two months ago, Dr. Trammell gave a presentation to the board about the curriculum work that we've done. And in English language arts, it's not only significant curriculum work that's asked something different of our teachers, but it's also the introduction of new instructional materials and new standards for teachers to work with. It's a great moment for us to see change through on a lot of different fronts, but it is um, a significant season of change for us. I want to give you kind of an overview, excuse me, of what that's looked like last year, this year, and what we have coming up in the next calendar year. We look at last year, in the spring, we began work to develop a pre-K through 12 curriculum across, our, across four core content areas. This year, we continued that work, and in August, we implemented um, several pieces of that curriculum for our four core content areas. Moving down the page, with instructional materials and TEKS, um, in the fall, we began this review process that culminates in this presentation tonight. In the spring, I pulled all of our K through eight teachers because um, when you have new standards, you need to um, take a moment to step aside and see what those ask of you that's the same and what's different that we need to consider. Um, as we move toward the summer, we'll continue curriculum revisions. And um, with your approval tonight, we'll receive materials and begin plans for next year with those instructional materials um, throughout K through eight classrooms in CSISD. Uh, there's a lot that's going to be on this page, so you are right here um, um, in this for us tonight. Okay. Uh, looking forward to next year, with regard to our curriculum, we'll continue professional development for Wave 1. And then we'll also continue writing curriculum for all of our other courses that are just staggered so that we can manage our time well as we move throughout that process. The arrival of instructional materials doesn't immediately um, instigate change. Really, it, it requires not only great materials, but also a depth of understanding for our teachers. And so we'll have professional development throughout the fall semester and spring on those new materials for our K through eight teachers. We'll also begin planning with those new standards that uh, will be, uh, we're expected from the state to implement and will be assessed on um, in the spring. We looked at next year, we'll also see new information um, pop up for our high school teachers. They're a year in arrears of this process um, that K-8 has gone through. And so we'll begin in the fall to look at uh, materials to make a recommendation to you again, hopefully in 11 or 12 months um, down the road. And then we'll educate our 9 through 12 teachers on the new standards and what those ask of us that's different as well. So it's in that season of change um, that um, I bring um, this recommendation to you. I want to share just a little bit about our process before I get to our recommendations. In October, a committee formed and principals nominated folks from across, across our English language arts and Spanish language arts classrooms to represent um, our school district as we looked at these materials. And in November, um, I met for, for the first time with these groups to set the stage, both because of that significant season of change that we find ourselves in and because of that unique process that only comes up every eight or nine years on the state's schedule. Uh, we began our review um, in November and December, and if you came into this very space that we're in right now, you would have seen it look something like this. Um, it's a significant number of materials that our teachers, our committee, went through to make sure that we found really great resources for our teachers. Um, there are really great resources out there that may not be the perfect fit for College Station ISD, though. And so it was one of my tasks to make sure that not only do we find good materials, but we found materials that fit with our teaks, with the time that our teachers have, with our beliefs, and with the way that we approach curriculum development in our school district. Uh, for instance, we're not going to be a school district that opens on, on um, the table of contents and works towards the index as our plan throughout the school year. And um, the overview that Dr. Trammell gave you of the way we approach curriculum just doesn't allow for us to pick up that um, a resource and use it in that manner. After going through that initial review process in January, we heard presentations from several vendors who remained um, in the process for us. Um, that meaning they were a good fit on those four fronts for us. In February, on February 20th, in fact, we held a parent and community review here at Central Office. And then in February and March, really the three weeks leading up to spring break, uh, we distributed the materials that were still up for consideration to campus so that our teachers could have an ample amount of time to review those pieces on campus and provide feedback to the committee. Just after 
spring break in March, the committee made recommendations. And based on those recommendations, I went to work in April to make sure everything not only fit on the fronts that I mentioned, but also fit within our budgets. Um, and that I then I went through the process of making sure I had all the proper quotes um, from all the vendors that we worked with um, to be able to make sure everything is accurate for our presentation here tonight. So with that, this is what our recommendations are with these four areas. The committee voted on English language arts and reading materials in K-5, and 76.2% um, voted for Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Spanish language arts and reading materials, and um, the colors are switched on you, but it is the same, um, the same publisher that we'll be working with. 87.5% of the committee voted for Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And our six through eight uh, group uh, were unanimous that Houghton Mifflin Harcourt provided the best resources to meet the needs of our students and teachers. And with regard to handwriting materials, 93.3% of the committee voted for Zaner Blozer Incorporated's handwriting materials. Um, I'm in like one of my happiest, nerdiest spaces talking about why these are great <laughs> materials. Um, so I've kept it to one slide. Um, but it is, it's more, right, it is, it's more than just finding something that everybody could agree on. The reasons we agreed on this, because it, these materials present a balanced literacy framework that we can customize to meet our needs. They provide great resources like the guide to reading books that um, are available in both English and Spanish that not only serve our dual language um, students well, but also serve any of our K-8 students where those pieces are in place um, as they grow as readers. Mentor texts are paired with writing mini lessons. Um, that means that that's not an additional step that teachers have to take as they go through that piece. Um, our, our resources to teach grammar and phonics and spelling are included in these materials. We have equitable Spanish materials and engaging handwriting materials. Um, and I could go on and on and like stop me anytime and like you'll have to, um, you'll have to cut me off. Um, but there's a, for many, many reasons, we feel great about making this recommendation to the board tonight. Um, the, um, the total budget comes in at $1,778,293.72. Um, and really, these are the pieces that our, our committee really felt this is going to set our teachers up for success and our students up for success as they, we grow readers and writers across College Station ISD. So in one slide, Proclamation 2019 asks school districts to form a committee to review materials and make a recommendation to the Board of Trustees. College Station ISD's committee has made a recommendation for instructional materials to meet the needs of Proclamation 2019. And we're coming to you tonight to request approval of the, procl the Proclamation 2019 adoption as presented to be purchased with instructional materials allotment funds. Any questions or comments? Great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, questions? I just have one question. Sure. Thank you for the presentation. It you was bet. great. Of course. Um, you mentioned that this particular curriculum allowed you to customize to meet our needs. Could you give an example of what that, what that looks like? Sure, so for out, throughout many different components of literacy instruction, you can, um, for instance, with different genres, sometimes it's less important if um, one goes before the other. Um, this gives us, um, our, our teachers set up our curriculum um, for this past year to where we have an established order that we feel like really helps us mm -hmm. meet the needs of our students and our teachers. And um, if there's a different order in the HMH resource, we can take their materials and put them in the order that we felt works best for us so that we haven't asked our teachers to change what they're doing in terms of curriculum in this past August and then again. <laughs> uh, we really feel like we've done our homework on the curriculum development process that we have here to really work towards some particular goals that fit f not just for students in general, but for students in our community. Um, and having developed those, um, we're, um, we're proud of that work and want to, um, and it's not that other folks couldn't come up with a good way to organize pieces there, but we, um, we want to make sure that we're taking materials and not just following what a publisher has to say, but saying, right. how does this fit with what we know is going to help our students walk away with um, the skills as readers and writers that we really want every kid to have. Thank you. you I bet. appreciate that. You bet. Yeah, I want to say I, I think it's really <laughs> neat the, the way after we've had a chance to see the process from curriculum development to now starting to see this phase of it where you start seeing, I'll say, the kind of the rubber meeting the road sure. where we're actually seeing acquisition of the materials that you're going to start implementing it. I did have one question. Is the, the amount within... 
the the amounts we've budgeted? Sure, I'd like to just uh, say something about that. Um, that is from our instructional materials allotment that we give from the state. So this is not local tax funds that we're using. We get every biennium, we get um, an, an allotment the first year of the biennium and the second year of the biennium uh, from the state based on numbers of students we have and other factors to be able to purchase uh, instructional materials and it can, can, including technology, and sometimes we purchase some technology with it. So, yes, we have uh, we have planned for this day. We have money available for this, and this uh, is within the inter instructional materials allotment money that we have uh, for this. And we're also, again, we're keeping an eye on the future because, as Mr. Hogan pointed out, we've got uh, 9th to 12th uh, part of this for, uh, for English language arts coming up next year. Certainly. Thank you. Any other questions, thoughts? And I think they're looking for approval. I move that we approve the K-8 English Language Tech Arts textbook adoption for the 1920 school year. I'll second. OK, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. Takes us to H2, consideration, discussion, and possible action related to the CSISD educator profile. Dr. Ely. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Members of the board, um, pleased to have Dr. Penny Trammell, our chief academic officer, come to you this evening and talk a little bit about uh, the development of our educator profile uh, in, here, in College Station ISD. You will recall a couple months ago, we shared with you the process that we used to come up uh, with our, our learner profile. Uh, and, and it really embodies what we want uh, all learners in College Station ISD to be able to do and accomplish uh, as a result of being a part of this school system. Uh, as we have worked with um, our leadership team in developing the educator profile, uh, Mr. Harris, you just used the term rubber meets the road. Um, we, we want to talk about our educator profile where the rubber meets the road this year as we're beginning the, the staffing process and hiring educators and making sure that uh, when we go and we're bringing in new teachers uh, to the school system and educators uh, of, of all uh, uh, shapes and sizes, uh, that they reflect the values that we hold dear uh, for, for people who work in College Station ISD. So I'm, I'm pr proud to have Dr. Trammell come up here and talk a little bit about this, the things that, uh, that, that we've determined moving forward and how we're going to put those into practice uh, from this point forward. So with that, Dr. Trammell. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to once again share another piece of the bigger puzzle that we are putting together for College Station ISD to uh, firmly guide our work and accomplish our vision for students. Um, I would like to uh, say kudos to the success team because this is not the work of one or two people. This is the work of all the leaders in our district, including you all, because we did once again involve the board's commitments and uh, beliefs and your priorities. So with that, uh, just a little bit of uh, we included your vision, your commitments to the community and the sex, success team's beliefs. Um, the vision statement that we came up with remains the same. We want the very best for our students. We want to prepare them for their future. And um, I won't read that to you again, but it is consistent with um, the vision that we came up with when we did the learner profile. In order to accomplish the learner profile, we need the right people in the classroom teaching them and the right support network surrounding them. Um, and we'll come to you at a later time with a leadership profile because obviously we need the right people leading um, the, the educators that educate the children. So uh, basically the educator profile is what we would like for every educator in College Station to portray as they provide for students, as they work with them to develop their cognitive, personal, and interpersonal competencies um, in the classroom and as they interact and collaborate with colleagues and our parents because it uh, takes a village, a team effort to uh, accomplish the uh, learner profile. Thank you. 
I'm just like, oh. Um, so to uh, accomplish the educo uh, educator profile, we started with beliefs, which I showed. We went through the affinity mapping process to get our categories. We did come up with five main categories for our educator profile. And then we fleshed out those categories based on all the information in the beliefs. And it, it kind of came out to these five categories. Um, we felt that it was very important to have positive relationships and um, a, a good learning environment in the classroom for students and in the school, quite frankly, um, that educators needed to be able to communicate and collaborate effectively. They needed to embrace learning themselves and model that. They needed to be passionate and committed um, and that they needed to create a digital learning environment to prepare students for their future because uh, that is part of the future. As we look at each one of those five criteria, when we look at Bill's positive relationships and environment, these are those specific details that came to be um, as we worked through and came to consensus on what does that mean? So under this particular category, valuing individual differences, focusing on the whole child, um, we expect in the classroom for our educators to be joyful, patient, flexible, nurturing, a great listener, fair and compassionate with our students. We want them to cultivate an enriching, safe environment where students feel comfortable and um, speak and share their thoughts and ideas. And we want um, the values and uh, relationships with students, families, and other uh, staff members to be evident. Um, who would not want that for their child, all children? Um, communicates and collaborates effectively. We know how important this is in the workforce today. We uh, work best with people who uh, we can bounce ideas off of and collaborate with. No one wants someone on their team who is difficult to work with. And we want those same things for our educators as they brainstorm and come up with greatness in the classroom for our kids. So promotes and partakes in positive, open, clear communication while maintaining their composure, collaborates positively with stakeholders in the best interest of the kids. So we want them to be able to set aside their personal um, preferences and come to compromises uh, for the kids. We want them to exhibit flexibility and empathy while focusing on solutions to reflect multiple perspectives and take initiative to help their colleagues and to be trustworthy. We also want them to embrace learning. We expect our kids to be lifelong learners. That is one of the things in the learner profile that we want for them. We know that you're not one and done. You don't get a bachelor's degree and then never learn anything else. You learn all your life. Um, whether you go back to school or life is your teacher or work is your teacher, you continue to learn. We expect our educators to model that for kids. And these are some of the things that we would like to see them do in order to do that. They have high expectations for themselves and the kids. They, we expect them to inspire students and um, their colleagues as they explore and work and learn. We want them to have students set goals and be proud of their accomplishments, model a growth mindset, and there are ways that you speak to others and students to promote that efficacy and that growth mindset. We want them to uh, in, be intrinsically motivated to seek professional learning opportunities and grow themselves. We want uh, to, them to engage, design, and facilitate um, just a quality learning environment. The, the next one was work with passion and commitment. 
Um, when teachers are excited about things, kids are excited about things. And so basically, uh, we want them to ignite students' passion and curiosity. Kids are naturally curious, and we shouldn't kill that. We want them to uh, nurture that, and um, they can do that in the classroom through being excited and preparing engaging, interesting lessons. Uh, we want them to be innovative and risk takers and use interesting strategies with kids. We want um, them to be passionate about students learning and maintain high expectations. And we want them to speak to students in a way that promotes high efficacy for our kids because kids have to believe in themselves too. And there are ways that teachers can give feedback that helps them do that. Uh, we want uh, teachers to take risks, persist in the face of challenge and adversity, and learn from failures. We want that same thing with our students. Um, maintain high student interest and engagement in learning. So as you look through these things, you'll start to see kind of a correlation between our learner profile and some of these attributes that we're expecting in our educators in the classroom. Uh, so there are certain things that the educators have to have in order to help our students have what we want them to have when they finish in our system. The, the fifth one is to create a digital learning environment. Now, this doesn't mean one-to-one, -one and we're going to have technology earbuds in our ears all the time and, you know, just go overboard. What this does mean is that we want them to leverage technology seamlessly in instruction to enhance the learning experience. So what that doesn't mean is play a game with, with no learning attached. Um, use a variety of technology, hardware, and software to manage the classroom. Give timely feedback and increase engagement. That's key. So we have software where teachers can monitor what's on every screen in their room. They can shut down a computer if someone is not on task. They can give immediate feedback if uh, Mr. Schaefer is doing something that perhaps he should not do. The teacher Pick can Mr. Schaefer. Uh, correct him uh, so point. that, you know, he is back on track and learning and and doing what he needs to do. Uh, so that requires some teacher training, but that's appropriate use of technology in learning. It's not um, sitting out there and the teacher doesn't walk by Quinn's desk, so he might he doesn't get feedback because he's quiet and obedient and, you know, um, <laughs> Uh, doing what he needs to do. So the, the digital advantages to monitoring the whole class and giving feedback to the whole class, the possibilities are really awesome, especially uh, for uh, students who, who are overt in being off task and the students who uh, are quiet but still need feedback. Um, and then incorporating technology into lessons that bring reciprocal partnerships into the classroom to enhance and give broader perspective on learning. An example of that, okay, so we, we are all in tune to House Bill 3 right now. So if I am in a high school government class or high school class and the teacher has today's meet, she might invite a senator to um, to come in and, in and join a class discussion on the latest events going on in the Senate. And um, politicians could actively participate. Parents could actively participate. Dr. Ely could actively participate from the parent, uh, perspective of a superintendent. So... Um, uh, it allows for, when we say reciprocal partnerships, it allows for learning beyond the classroom 
and it allows for kids to have dialogue with people with different perspectives and different knowledge. Um, sometimes that's parents, sometimes that's business partners, sometimes that's who knows other people, anyone from around the world with uh, web access could participate in a discussion. So um, w that's what we're talking about when we say creates a digital learning environment. So it's to intentionally enhance learning, not to sit and, you know, be on Facebook. That's to me, not learning. That is not learning. So I just want to be clear about that. Um, so how does educator profile impact our work in hiring? So I was having a discussion with one of the principals, um, Ms. Barrington, and she was interviewing and I was telling her uh, how Dr. Ely and I had used the leadership profile when we were interviewing some candidates. And she said, you know what, I think I'm going to do that with the educator profile. And so, um, you know, when you are interviewing people and you put those profiles up and you say, okay, let's look at this category and let's look at these indicators. Does this person exhibit that for kids or for a school? It, it, it makes it easy to know, is this a person that fits what we want? for kids or for to lead our campus. So um, it definitely will influence hiring, perhaps the kind of questions we ask, um, certainly the attributes we are expecting. Instruction, no doubt. We need a certain kind of teacher in the classroom and um, it helps us focus our professional learning for the great teachers we already have. So part of uh, actualizing that learner profile is getting the right training to the good teachers we have. Um, our long-range technology plan, obviously, you don't, you're not magically born with the skills to properly monitor and incorporate um, effective use of technology. Professional learning, T-tests, teacher evaluations, it would be if you can't establish a learning environment that's safe where you have uh, risk taking and kids asking questions and learning and extending beyond, you know, they don't feel safe. Uh, that's a, that that's not conducive to our learner profile and what we want our kids to accomplish. So we want to work on that. Um, certainly our district and campus improvement plans, budget priorities, actualizing the learner profile. Um, and accomplishing the vision for our district. So those are just a few ways and um, that we feel like our educator profile will help us accomplish what we want to accomplish for our kids. So um, with that, do you have any questions? We're excited to have another one of our documents finished to guide our work. Great, thank you very much. You bet. For the report and for the work. Uh, questions, comments? I was just going to say that that was a fantastic explanation, explaining the why we do it. And then I wrote down early on how is this used in the district because I wanted to ask, but you covered that. Mm -hmm. You covered that beautifully. Yeah. So thank so, you. You're welcome. Penny, I think that this is a phenomenal presentation, um, building a competency framework, not just for the learners, but for the educators to match is very important to achieving the ultimate goal. So hats off to you and the entire team um, for creating that. Quick question, um, I noticed that you'd said um, teacher evaluations. Mm -hmm. So after the training, will this be incorporated and in, will we be measuring these competencies through their work throughout the year? How will we, how will mm -hmm. we know if we have teachers that embrace or embody these competencies? Sure. Um, you know, uh, principals actually help develop this. So um, they, this is what they feel uh, exemplifies outstanding teachers. Um, our professional learning will involve um, building teachers' capacity to teach in this way. Our curriculum 
strives for transfer of learning mm -hmm. all the way through the system, the same transfer. So it all works together. So we will work as a team to build the kind of instruction and uh, learning that we want to see happening in the classroom. So to answer that, um, they will use it to help them hire, kind of like Miss Barrington uh, used it the other day as she was interviewing. I would assume um, Nkrumah and uh, Miss, hopefully Miss Hickman, mm -hmm. <laughs> will uh, use it in the HR department. Uh, it could be used for questioning, uh, to profile people. We want to get the right people. We also have great people already. Oh, yeah. So we want to be sure that we have something to guide and focus our professional learning. And so we feel like this will help us do that. It could be used for self-analysis. I can say, wow, where am I mm -hmm. in each one of these five categories? What do I need? Set my goals. Um, teachers set goals with principals every single year. And... They could do self-analysis and set goals for themselves, which is some of the most powerful things you can do to grow. So, so one of the, <clears throat> Mrs. Green, one of the tangible ways that we'll be doing this as well uh, is the community-based accountability system that we're developing right now. I right. uh, believe we'll be doing an update on that uh, if it's the board's will in June. Uh, but one of those pillars is professional uh, yeah. development and quality staff, professional learning and quality staff. One of the key questions we have in that. Uh, and that pillar is to what extent do College Station ISD teachers exemplify mm -hmm. the qualities as, um, as, as laid out in the educator profile. So that's something that we as a school system will actually be looking at. Uh, and so we're, we look forward to the developing, development of what that might look like and, and kind of gauging ourselves as to what we're, uh, how we're doing in that and improving over the years. Of course. Thank you. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Takes us to H33. Yeah. Consider approval of CSISD long range technology plan for 2019 to 2024. Dr. Ely. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Uh, you recall last month we got together for a two hour management oversight workshop uh, for technology. Uh, and in that, uh, Mr. Hutchison, who's with us again this evening, did a great job of taking us through uh, the presentation and talking about where we are uh, in, in a number of ways, both with our infrastructure and with instructional technology and management information system. Uh, during that presentation, he spoke a little bit about the long-range technology plan and how that is guiding our work. Uh, in, uh, in guiding uh, our direction in the future. So we have finished the work uh, on that plan, and uh, we have Mr. Hutchison, our Director of Technology, here uh, to take us through just a, a brief presentation on the Long Range Technology Plan for 2019 to 2024, uh, its goals, and um, where we're moving in the future. I'm trying to vamp. Keep you. So keep, keep going. I've run out of words, David. So there it is right there. And with that, Mr. Hutchison. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ely, members of the board, Mr. Harris. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come in front of you and let you know about what we've been doing for the past three months, working on this long-range technology plan and developing a path for us to continue our hard work in technology and give us a direction of where we're going in the next five years. So. That being said, why do we have it? Um, and for those of, you, those of you who have been around long enough, we used to, this was mandated by the state. Um, for whatever reason, the state has decided it's not a mandated plan we have to have in place. But as a district, we felt, you know, we need to have some kind of direction, something to guide us. So this is continued on. We've actively pursued, we've actively, you know, used this. And so it's a district-wide plan. We're going to go through multiple steps of it. I think, I've, yes, it was included in the agenda that you do have the full document. So this will just be a brief explanation of it. But it is supposed to support our bigger picture. And so when we brought the committee together, these were three items that we brought together is district-wide. How does it fit the bigger picture, not just individual campus, not an individual department? What's the big goal? And so we wanted to make sure it included our vision, measurable outcomes, and specific activities. So all of that was hopefully incorporated in the 
plan, and I think we have a very good plan for y'all to look at. So that being said, yes, it was, well, two, oh, two months, two and a half months. So we did three meetings. The first meeting we brought together to the entire committee. I want to thank Ms. Nolan. I know you were our board member in charge, and you came and, you know, gave lots of good insight and good feedback, so we appreciate that. The last plan we did, we had a smaller group, and we felt we wanted to expand the scope. So if you look, there is a lot of people on here. I think 30 is total is what we have. And we tried to encompass everybody from administrators for curriculum instruction people to our campus technology facilitators to librarians. We tried to get everybody involved in this so that we get a good wide perspective. And when we even went into our little smaller groups inside the big groups, we broke them out and made sure that we had not all the administrators would clump together, not all the CTS would clump together, and all the right brains. We kind of spread them all together so we'd get good opinions on everybody and they would bring their perspectives to us. So um, the first meetings we sat down and we did look at the educator profile. We looked at the learner profile, our district improvement plan. We incorporated all of those areas into it to make sure that we really were making sure we're ready for the next five years of where we need to go and that everybody had a good vision to it. The one thing we really tasked our people with is to sit down and say, there's technology that's going to be in these kids' hands that we haven't even thought about yet. So how do we prepare for that? Because in five years, Lord knows what may be out there. But we may need to make sure we get the skills and we need to make sure we have the infrastructure and the processes in place to really let them grow. And so I think we've accomplished all of that in there. So with that, I will go to our three goals that we've developed. And again, for those of you who remember, it used to be four. That was a state mandate, it had to be four goals. Um, we kind of took professional development and communication that used to be more towards administration. And then there was another thing about the communi community involvement and we felt we pulled those all together. So based off of, you know, three long, meetings we set together and came up with these three goals and regarding teaching and learning. And I kind of think of that as how do we actually help the teachers? How do we affect the classrooms? That's kind of what everything involved in that group. So it also included, you know, what kind of devices do we need to include in there? Um, what kind of skills do we need to make sure our teachers have? What kind of equipment do we need to make sure our teachers have? What kind of um, skills do our kids need to have? So that was all included in there. Um, we also went a lot into digital resources because a lot of our stuff is going online and we wanted to make sure that we have the right resources for our teachers and our students to utilize this changing world on us and have that involved in there. Um, next one is the professional development. So we wanted to make sure all stakeholders, including you know, faculty, staff, administrators, students, community, everybody had you know, the right amount of knowledge skills to purposely integrate instructional technology into our experiences. So that included, you know, looking at things like we've heard Mizuni mentioned around here before. So we are able to look at our existing Mizuni system, which pulls all of these databases that we have together so that we can get a better vision of what the kid's doing. So we can look and see maybe we're missing something, maybe we're not missing something. So that was included in there. Schoology was a big part of this. We've invested a lot of time and resources into Schoology to really help the community know what the child's doing, but also help the child grow with their online footprint. And then we had the technology ecosystem, fancy word for basically making sure that everything we've involved in technology is included in here. So infrastructure, the wires, the switches, all of that wonderful stuff that I get crazy on. But that also includes a lot of the other stuff about, you know, cybersecurity and digital, um, digital learning environment. All of the stuff was included in there. So that's how we wrapped up these things. So. I wanted to throw about recurring themes that we kind of had throughout the plan. So online curriculum and digital resources, I think it's obvious. Um, we're moving to an online world. How do we do that in a correct way, an appropriate way, and an efficient way of making sure it's not being used for Facebook, like Dr. Trammell mentioned? How are our kids doing the right things at the right time? Um, also, that includes parents. And that was a big push in to make sure our parents and staff had the tools that they needed to know to be involved in our child, how we can grow them how we can make sure they're fostering, growing in the right direction. Professional development assistance. So we're putting a lot of resources into devices. We're putting a lot of resources into equipment, cabling, wires, all of that stuff. We're making sure we're putting in our biggest asset, and I think it's 82% of our budget is faculty and staff. So we wanted to make sure that our teachers had the tools and the training to be able to utilize 
all of this wonderful stuff we're throwing at them so that they're not struggling when we throw something new at them. They're prepared to take care of it and take our children into the next 20, 30, 40 years. Anyway, um, increased devices and resources. We had a lot of conversation about this. How many devices do we need? What's the ratios? Um, and so part of this plan is for us to be tasked to go through and try to figure out what is that appropriate ratio. Um, is it one to one? Is it five to one? Is it three to one? What kind of devices are they? So that gives us a plan to move forward with all of that to make sure we're putting the right tools in the right child's hands. Um, mobile devices, obviously, we're becoming a mobile to world. Um, we've tasked it. We already did that in the last plan, but we're moving forward in the future plan if, you know, everybody has some kind of device that's wireless. And so we need to make sure that we're supporting that, not only school devices, but the students' devices and everybody else. And an important emphasis on digital citizenship. Um, we've been doing that for the past couple of years, and we want to increase that because, yes, we've put a lot of resources into making sure that we keep our children per safe, cybersecurity-wise, things like that. But how do we train our children on how to know when they're not controlled in an environment, what's the proper thing to do? What's the safe thing to do? How to be good digital stewards? And so we wanted to make sure that we put an emphasis on that. So training, professional resources, um, programs, things like that. So all of that was included in the plan. Um, I know I'm glossing over a whole lot of it. It's a lot more in the details um, in the document that we shared with you. But I do want to just kind of point up these are recurring themes that we kind of covered through. And with that, I'll open up for questions and comments. Thank you very much for that. I start off with that last point. I appreciate the, the focus on the digital citizenship. I, I knew that that was very important when I had a group of high school kids telling me about, I think it's VPNs mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, and how those can be used to defeat firewalls and other things that we might try to put in place to shield them. So I, I'm glad helping them understand, well, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. Uh, so thank you for that focus uh, and for all the good work. Uh, other comments? You know I have comments. Yeah. Um, so this, this committee, I was very impressed with this committee. First off, I will say that it was definitely out of my comfort zone. Um, if you went in that meeting, you could point out who did not belong. That would have been me. Um, but... I was able to ask all the questions I wanted. Tons of really good questions were asked throughout the entire process. Um, rich discussions were had um, by everyone in the room, I believe. Some of them, um, I mean, they were, they, they were great discussions. And I actually, on a more personal level, I kind of had a mind shift about technology by being a part of this committee. I mean, I've told some people how surprised I was what I got out of being on this committee, just listening to the, the areas and the types of things that our district wants to do with technology. Because just like they said with the educator profile, you know, um, she kept saying enhance lear the learning experience. And that is exactly what they're trying to do. And as a, I went in more as a parent than a school board member, I'll be honest. <laughs> and I, I, was, I was a little um, apprehensive about all of the technology stuff. Right, um, but I came out of that uh, feeling much more confident with this plan being in place, um, and with the the leadership that we have taking this on, and the ideas that they have for our district in terms of technology. So I feel very comfortable with this. I think it's a very comprehensive plan, albeit maybe a little bit lofty. Um, five years. But I know it's five years, but um, and it has to be lofty because. Like they said, you know, in five years, we don't know what our kids are going to have in front of them. Um, but I appreciate the work that was done on this committee and, um, and putting up with me. <laughs> well, thank you. I'd like to make the comment that I think a lot of the technology that we're doing in the classroom, obviously, is paying off. Um, you saw it a lot tonight in some of the recognitions. I think the thing that kind of really resonated with me was the increased mobile devices and support. Um, I don't want to think that I'm getting old, <laughs> but um, I think the support that I recall back when my kids were going to school um, in regards to mobile devices, if they had it out, it was $5. So, I mean, it's um, 
it's come a long way with the technology today than it was, say, 10 years ago when it was almost prohibited or forbidden to be on the desk. Has been a big shift. We would be looking for uh, approval. Okay. I make the motion that we approve the plan as presented. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to H4. Consider approval of a new math course at AMCHS and CSHS for the 2019 20 school year. Dr. Ely. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. We pulled this off of consent agenda, so we just give a, a, just a brief background on this. We did not get a chance to get to this during our 5 o'clock workshop session. So uh, this is about uh, an additional course that we would like uh, to schedule some students into uh, at our two comprehensive high schools, a and Consolidated and College Station High School. Uh, and with more information on this course uh, is Dr. Trammell. Dr. T. Hi. Um, this is a course that the high schools came to me uh, to consider for students who come to our country with very limited English proficiency and very limited knowledge of mathematics. Uh, in the discussion, things were said like some of these kids uh, don't have schooling beyond sixth grade. They come to us anywhere from fourth grade to close to ninth grade competency, but then they're expected to go into algebra. Some of them score on their oral, ling uh, oral language proficiency test as newcomers, so they don't have the language and they don't have the math uh, skills with numbers. So they would like to, uh, they found a course um, on TEA, it's an innovative course that they feel like would be beneficial for these students. It's not in the course catalog. It has been approved by DEIC. It has been approved by both campuses' um, SIT teams, so they're site-based teams. Um, but they and they would want to hand uh, place students that they feel are really at risk that this course would benefit. Um, in this course, um, but it would be uh, kind of a, I don't want to say a prep course. It would count as an elective. It wouldn't count as a math course, but it would be math, kind of co-taught between the ESL teacher and a certified math teacher to get them ready for Algebra 1. Um, they could either be enrolled in Algebra 1 and this course at the same time, or they could take this course one year and then Algebra 1 the next year but they feel like it would really increase the success level of the kids that are coming to us uh, without language and the math skills that they need. Um, they feel like um, this could, as we continue to get more and more ESL students um, that have lower ES, uh, language proficiency, that this course will be invaluable. Uh, so they don't anticipate huge enrollment, but they do feel like there's, you know, a dozen or so at each campus that, that this would be critical for. So with that, we are asking uh, the board tonight to approve this innovative course. Um, it would not count as a math course, of course. It would count as an elective um, for these uh, two high schools, for two comprehensive high schools. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, any questions, comments, or motions? I have a question on the... It says fee five hundred dollars. Is there a, is there a charge for this course? That would just be probably for materials that they would need, mm -hmm. um, and we would use um, like we would any course. We'd probably use IMA funds for that or Title Three funds. Okay. Since uh, not a fee for the student. 
No, it, oh, we don't charge for the students. Just, just, no. just making sure as I see fee. <laughs> no, thank you for asking. No, that would be probably Title III since their English language proficiency would be Got it. at a newcomer level. Um, Ms. Marl is in the off, in the, it would be an appropriate use of funds for that, or we could use IMA. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So with that, we would ask the board to approve this course for the high schools. I move that we approve the math course at AMC HS and CSHS for 1920 school year. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you. Okay, that takes us to item I-1. Consider approval of new administrator contracts as recommended by the superintendent of schools, Dr. Ely. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. We have a, a number of administrative recommendations to bring to you this evening. Uh, and I'm excited because I think almost everyone's here with us this evening. So uh, as I call your name and give a little bit of information about you, I would ask that you please stand and Thad Laster, you get to be an exemplar for everybody. So if you'd please stand and show them how it's done. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the board, I'd like to introduce Thad Laster. Um, he is my recommendation uh, to serve as the next director for business services. Uh, Thad uh, would be replacing Deborah Parks, who re uh, retired earlier this semester. Thad comes to us from LaPorte ISD, where he's the director of finance. Uh, prior to LaPorte, he served nine years uh, in Dalhart ISD up in the panhandle as both a director of accounting and then as chief financial officer. Uh, before coming to public schools, he worked in a private accounting firm where he uh, did among other things, school district audit, uh, audits. Uh, so that comes to us with a lot of great experience in a number of districts. Uh, and so uh, he'd be my recommendation for the Director of Business Services. We can, thank you, thank you, Dad. Uh, next recommendation is Dr. Nkruma Dixon. Dr. Dixon. Dr. Dixon is no stranger to us, and he's a recommendation uh, for Director of Employee Engagement. Uh, he'd be moving up from the Assistant Director of Human Resources position. Uh, and Kruman's been in College Station ISD for 14 years. Prior to this position, uh, as Assistant Director, he served as a coordinator of HR and as principal of AM Consolidated Middle School. So that would be our recommendation for the Director of Employee Engagement. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Uh, number three, Stormy Hickman. Stormy, please stand up. Thank you. Stormy would be our Director of Talent Management. Uh, Stormy would be replacing Monica James, who is leaving to become the Executive Director for Human Resources in Waxahachie ISD. Stormy's been with the College Station for 17 years, uh, and most recently as Principal of Spring Creek Elementary School. Uh, she's also served as Assistant Principal at Greens Prairie and Assistant Principal at A&M Consolidated High School, among other things. So, uh, Director for Talent Management and recommendation is Stormy Hickman. Uh, we also have four assistant principal uh, recommendations for you this evening. Uh, first on that list is Austin Chandler. Austin, please stand. Thank you. Austin, uh, it would be a recommend for assistant principal at College Station High School. Uh, right now he is serving, uh, he'll be replacing Trey Davis, who left College Station High School to be principal, come principal at Normandy High School. Um, for the last three years, Austin has served as an assistant principal in Taylor ISD uh, at uh, Taylor Middle School. So welcome, Austin. <laughs> Crystal Vasquez. Crystal is a, a recommendation to become assistant principal at Southwood Valley Elementary School. Uh, she fills a vacant position at this time. Uh, Crystal comes to us from Rockdale ISD most recently, where currently she's serving as the district's elementary instructional coordinator. Prior to that, she was a math interventionist in grades six through eight at the middle school there in Rockdale and worked uh, in Bryan ISD prior to that. Uh, so assistant principal, our recommendation for assistant principal at Southwood Valley is Crystal Vasquez. Heather Sherman. Heather Sherman is, uh, is our recommendation to become assistant principal at River Bend. That is a brand new campus, and so it is a new position with the opening of that campus. Uh, Heather's been with College Station ISD for six years, serving as both an elementary assistant principal and an intermediate school art facilitator. So our recommendation for assistant principal at River Bend is Heather Sherman. 
and Amanda Allen. Uh, Amanda Allen is, assist, uh, is our recommendation to be assistant principal at Creekview Elementary. Um, she's replacing Allie DeLuna, who's le leaving to become principal of Southwood Valley. Uh, she comes to Creekview from Creekview, uh, where she serves right now as the math specialist and has since 2014. Prior to that, Amanda worked in Bryan ISD and among other districts as both a math and science instructional coach and a TAP master teacher. So our recommendation uh, for assistant principal at Creekview Elementary is Amanda Allen. <laughs> Mr. President, members of the board, those would be my recommendations uh, to fill uh, these uh, seven administrative vacancies in College Station ISD. I'd love to answer any questions that you may have. Great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and I know that we're all very excited for each of you and uh, for the students and the good work that you'll do on their behalf. Uh, does anyone have any questions, comments? Well, I make a motion that we approve the new administrator contracts as recommended by the superintendent of schools. Okay, we have a yep. we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries seven zero. So thank you all and congratulations. Welcome everyone. Welcome. That takes us to I-2. Consider approval of new administrator contract, contract subject to approval of the Regional Office of Head Start as recommended by the Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Ely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. We, we did this one differently uh, because it has one additional layer of approval. Uh, recommend to you tonight uh, to uh, employ Susan Heath uh, as the Director for Early Education Services. Susan would be replacing Sharon Jackson, who is retiring at the end of uh, this summer. Uh, Susan served as the operations manager for Early Head Start in this district. That's our birth to two, two-year-old program uh, for four and a half years before leaving to go into consulting, private consulting in 2014. Um, since this position oversees the Head Start program as well as pre-K, it must also be approved by the Office of Head Start. Uh, so um, is Susan is not here. I've not seen her, right? Okay, thank you. Um, so she doesn't get to stand up. But... Uh, um, maybe she's standing up wherever she is. Uh, so uh, my uh, recommendation would be uh, to approve uh, S Susan Heath as the Director for Early Education Services, contingent upon approval of the Office of Head Start. Love to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions for Dr. Ely? I would uh, move approval of Susan Heath as presented. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 7-0. So congratulations to Susan Heath pending approval of Office of the Head Start, wherever yeah, she may be standing. A, a question on that. Do we have a timetable on when that potential approval could be done? We're, we're hoping by June. Okay. 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 That takes us to L1 and L2. Uh, and the board will go into executive session for these two items. And I will read the statements at this time. For L1, the board will meet in executive session to conduct a closed meeting to deliberate the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property because the deliberation in an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the position of the district in negotiations with a third party. The executive session deliberations will be held pursuant to the deliberation regarding real property, closed meeting exception to the Texas Open Meetings Act as set forth in section 551.072 of the Texas Government Code. And, and then after that, we will move into L2, pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.0821, hearing a Level 3 parent complaint, and if necessary, consultation with legal counsel via telephone pursuant to Texas Government Code Sections 551.071 and 551.129. So at this time, the board will retire to executive session, and then we would return 
uh, into open session prior to in, any action taken on either of those matters uh, and M1. Uh, so with that, we will retire to executive session. The board is now returned to open session at 10.04 p.m. on May 21st. Does any board member wish to make a motion regarding the level three parent complaint we have just heard? I, uh, I will move that the board deny the appeal and uphold the administration's ruling. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries 7-0. This appeal is now concluded. Thank you for your participation in the district's grievance process. And with that, we are adjourned.